Well, I always gagged on that silver spoon. Bernstein, if I hadn't been very rich, I might have been a really great man. This is Henry Chamberlain, and it's my pleasure to uh, bring to you uh, Jerome Charon, a distinguished novelist. We're going to be talking about uh, Big Red, and there's uh, so many uh, ways to to go at this, uh, Jerome. Thank you so much for doing this interview. No. I wanted to, uh, well, it's been in my head uh, lately because I, I watched Citizen Kane again uh, just the other night, and there's that moment when uh, Orson Welles says, if I only I had not been wealthy, maybe I could have been a great man. And I think in some, I think in some ways that answers a lot of of, of of the things going on in Big Red, don't you think? Well, um, I I don't I don't know, Henry. It's difficult to uh, you could say, if only I'd not been Orson Welles, I would have been a great man. In other words the flaws in his personality. I mean, um, the the megalomania produced great art because he said, I want to do this. He, he did things that were considered impossible. But on the other hand, personally, the megalomania was so great that um, I was originally going to try to tell the novel in his voice, and I realized that every word he said was a lie. You know, is that is he exaggerated? He, he, you know, th there was no way to get at the truth as to what, who he was. You know, if you've seen Mr. Cotton, I don't know if you've seen. Yeah. Him, so, oh yeah. Um, th this strange person coming, you know, through the sky at you. Uh, and I, I was also trying to think why why do we remember him um, and and Kubrick and and Tonioni were both great film directors maybe even as great as he was and yet he's the one we really remember he's the one we have seventy books about he's the one who appears you know, as a character in films who appears in novels you know, why not Kubrick. Because he was, um, uh, well, well, for example, when uh, I, I just learned, I was reading a biography of, uh, of Balanchine and, and just learned that Kubrick uh, had a girlfriend who was in the corps de ballet in Balanchine's. And there was always, you know, he hated, boyfriend, he hated his dances to have boyfriends. And outside of the of the ballet, there was this sort of uh, man in a dirty coat with a with a beard, and it was Kubrick. You know, <laughs> the thing, things you never you know you 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 learn in such an offhanded way. We remember Wells because he was outsides. He was you know um, exuberant. He was he was always looking. To do the impossible, you know, uh, he was a kind of Don Quixote who wasn't crazy, a sane Don Quixote. That's what he was, and maybe even a little bit evil. He probably was evil. Well, selfish for one thing. I, I think to... more than selfish. I mean, selfish. You know, we're all selfish, but I think he there. There was a touch in a touch of evil. There was a touch of evil in it. I think. Well, it's a beautiful balancing act that you do in Big Red because it's Rita Hayworth, who the, the camera might be tilting a little more towards her. It's both of them vying for attention. Yeah. They're, they're both opposites. We've heard that a lot. It's been said so many times. But a lot of it has to do with how much they were alike because they were both larger than life icons. Yeah. Uh, and that's interesting to me because... They are they're definitely both of them are a case of truth being stranger than fiction. And yet you found a way to go beyond that and create your own fiction. Well, that's the the whole point of, of trying, you know, people say, well, uh, 
uh, these characters existed, these uh, historical novels. Well, they aren't. They're really fictional. You know, I, I, uh, I, I, I never distort, I never lie, and yet they're still fictional. Uh, um, Wells's voice w was already in my head, you know, because I, I could sense him. Rita had no voice, so it was a little bit difficult. But uh, on the other hand, uh, there just so it was something about him and, and also something that was so touching about her, as I say, you know, in the afterward, I, I wanted to break the reader's heart, you know, to show a person who, you know, who wanted so, who had so much and wanted so little and finally got so little, you know, mm. the problem. Well, let me do, as, as I had to promised sure. off camera, camera to uh, do a little share screen. Sure. And this, I think, will really be a nice treat for for viewers. Right. Help get guide along, pep up our, spike up our conversation. Spike up me is for God. I, I I've got the the difficult role of asking you questions, but it's just uh, just interesting how in 1941 you've got the most amazing movie ever, Citizen Kane, and in that same year it, it's Blood and Sand. For, right for uh rita plus a a, a musical with fred astaire which he's just such an amazing dancer yeah she astaire said he never wanted to dance with her again because she was better than he was and uh whether whether and here you have that wonderful glass ball which you know says so much about you know uh Citizen Kane, and you know, is a kind of MacGuffin, but uh, and yet the splintering, you know, he repeats that in the in the mirror scene uh, in in, uh, in the lady from Shanghai, that splintered glass. You know? Yeah, yeah, I I have something to ask you about that in a in a in a bit, but here right. we have the, this uh, really heartbreaking photo of uh, Margarita. And Sino, but before all the all the major stars, right. and so then compare that to Orson Welles, who repeatedly says, and I think he's almost apologetic anyway that he was never told he couldn't do something. He was always exactly. told, he was, always told he was wonderful. He was the boy genius, you know. Even at the age of six months, you know, he was uh, there was nothing he couldn't do, and 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 to a certain extent. It was true. He went to Dublin uh, at at fifteen and and joined the a theater company. Uh, you know things that would have been impossible. Um, he created havoc on the radio uh, uh, with the War of the Worlds. He he changed theater. He changed everything. As I say in the book, he was a dynamiter. He exploded. You know, and uh, this is why we remember him. You know. It was it was a kind of a he was a kind of atomic bomb, you know. I watched this amazing uh, documentary. If you, I don't know if you've seen the Criterion version of uh, Citizen Kane. They have this great documentary. B right. I think it's BBC, and they say well, part of the magic was he didn't know any better. Exactly. He no, he, it's not. It's not simply that he didn't know any better. It's that. Nothing was impossible to him. He, yeah. he said he wanted. And Greg Tolan, uh, you know, who volunteered to be his cinematographer, you know, was was eager to as as eager to experiment as he was, you know. So instead of having no ceiling, they had no floor. And they <laughs> shot, you know, from below rather than from above. So uh it, it it's it's really uh you know, you could say that whether you like Citizen Kane or not, whether you think it's the greatest movie, or, you know, it's irrelevant. One, one could pick five or six others, but it's a film about the making of film, and there's no other film that could serve the same example of things that are impossible to do and are still done. You know? And I think that the tragic quality of it is that it's really not about Hearst. It's about, you know, it, it's about Wells. 
It's about Wells' childhood, really. Hearst is, you know, he may be in the guise of a newspaper man, but it doesn't really matter. And, and, and if we remember Hearst now, it's only through the, you know, the battle of Citizen Kane. You know, history is strange. History forgets everything, and yet it, it's persistent about a few things, and it's been a persistent, constant about Orson Welles. I mean, uh, when you had this article debunking him, you know, uh, the undoing of, uh, of Citizen Kane, you know, in the 70s, you, you thought it was, it was all over for him, and yet it wasn't. You know, he's still here. Yeah, you know, um, Mankiewicz, uh, who really uh, was was a kind of hack, um, did contribute to the writing of Citizen Kane. But to say that he was the author of Citizen Kane is utterly ridiculous. You know, he was a hack. Well, I I come fresh from that documentary, and, and I I. I love the, the back and forth that uh, Pauline Kael does trying to, she, it's a reputation. She can't really be against Citizens Kane's uh, mastery of the medium, but she still sticks to that. Well, you know, <laughs> maybe uh, it, 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 it doesn't matter if he wrote it or not. He's, he's still, uh, he, that doesn't, that doesn't, uh, his reputation doesn't rest on that. So she tries yeah, to. But, but what's interesting, Henry, is that even though everything she says about Kane is a lie, mm -hmm. it's a great essay because <laughs> it really tells you about what it was like to be a writer in the 20s and 30s in Hollywood. Yeah. So finally, it's not about, you know, Mankiewicz and Kane. It's about the, the, the quality of what these Broadway writers did how they changed cinema, how they changed dialogue in the 1930s and when she grew up and saw films in the 20s. That's why it's such, uh, you know, even though the essay is forgotten to some degree, it's, it, you know, and I hated her for what she said about, um, uh, you know, about Kane, and it took up two issues in The New Yorker. So it's amazing how, uh, you know, how forgetful we are as we move from generation to generation. I don't think most young people would not even know who Pauline Kael was. But that essay is extraordinary. And even though I hate it, it's still extraordinary because it tells you how these writers change cinema once the talkies, you know, uh, overtook, you know, film in the 30s. So history is very strange. It's about forgetting, and yet there are a few things. We, we all remember Wells. I don't think even the young people who say, I'm today old, or whatever bullshit that, that is said, uh, they still remember him. Why? I mean, it's, it's really weird. You know, he imposes himself upon history in everything he does. Now, in the novel, you talk about the Wonder Show, and right. I thought I thought all of that was uh, complete fiction, and then it turns out there really was a Wonder Show. No, no, it was completely historical. No. Uh, and and a, a tent, I, I I could imagine there being a, a tent put up. Um, or what was there a tent, or was it more yes, like a? Yes, there was a tent. Yeah, wow, there was a tent. Yeah. I just want to uh, just want no no thank you yeah. um but uh, you see that she was happiest when she was with him and she loved him all her life and she probably loved his genius and um we don't know you know when you say he was selfish I, I agree with that but he was, he was more than selfish. He was a cannibal. He ate up everything around him, you know. He took up all the air, all the oxygen, all the space. He left no space for anyone else. Yeah, it would be pure speculation. Uh, it, maybe if they had, 
had therapy or something back then. They, they could have stayed together, but they were so different. And she was, I, I guess, in ways pulling him down. And he he just had to keep. Well, he one, completely one destroyed her. He destroyed her by cutting her hair. You know, I mean, she was the most famous star in the world. And I, I still believe that that he had no reason to cut her hair other than to create havoc. And he destroyed his own career because if he had kept that, you know, that rich red hair in the lady from Shanghai, I think whether it's incomprehensible or not, she would have been so beautiful in the way she was in Gilder that it would have been an incredible hit. And yet he destroyed every possibility of having it become a success. And he did that repeatedly, time after time after time. And yet he's the one that we remember. It's strange. Spielberg can have, you know, 3,000 hits, but they're not great films. Well, I get the impression that he was, I mean, the results speak for themselves, but he was kind of stumbling around the direction of always wanting to be the artist. And then when he tried to do something conventional, like I, I just recently found out, a, this rediscovered The Stranger from 1946. When right. he tries something conventional, it, it falls flat. Well, you have to remember that he didn't cut that film. It was very, very different. It was a, it was a different beginning. Uh, and he was, uh, you know, this, it, he, he had a cutter uh, that the, the, it begins, the, the scenes in Argentina are, are, are much, much longer. And uh, I think if he had been given the freedom of doing the, the film the way he wanted it, it would have been very different. Hmm. Though I don't believe in his character at all. I mean, the, the, the story is nonsensical. A guy, you know, uh, one, of, one of the architects of, of the gas chambers suddenly three weeks later appears in, in, in a small town in Massachusetts. It doesn't make any sense. It's, it's, it's crazy. But even in its craziness, if he had been left alone, uh, and remember, I... I I, I do believe that he wrote the screenplay. I mean, I, I may, you know, I may misremember that, but I think he did the screenplay. So, and, and also, he had one great flaw. He could be a terrible actor. He could be a great actor. He could be a terrible director. He could be a great director. But he was never a great writer. Mm -hmm. so that's why, I mean, if you think of someone like Tarantino, who's the one I compare him to, they both, you know, changed cinema. But <laughs> Tarantino is one of the worst actors in the world. And, I mean, if you look at a film like The Third Man, I mean, Wells is mesmerizing. He doesn't appear until way past the middle of the film. And yet his first appearance, when you see him in the light, standing by the stairs you know it just it, it gives you the chills every time you see it with that smile that impish smile i'm a bad boy that's what he's saying mm -hmm. i remember uh, sharing that movie with some family members and uh it was that that movie is not a crowd pleaser movie it's 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 uh, it's got some convoluted things going on it's not a straight on story so at the end of it people were scratching their heads and i was saying oh shoot maybe that wasn't really the one <laughs> to show the, uh, but it was an enormous hit in its time henry it's that's the film that made him this is i mean um oh that that the film that made him famous I and mean, he became famous after his performance in the third man oh sure and with, with that theme music for sure and, the, and everywhere he went, they would play that theme music <laughs> if he entered a restaurant or whatever. Now, I just wanted to share this with folks. If you've never <coughs> seen William Randolph Hearst, this is a three-in-one. You've got Hearst, you've got Luella Parsons, and then sandwiched in, very nervous, not 
too happy to be there, Betty Davis. Betty Davis, yeah, looking beautiful, by the way. You know. Yeah. Great actress, but not a great beauty. And then Charles Foster Kane. Now, I I think that uh, this is kind of going out on a limb, but it's, it seems kind of a funny thought that Orson Welles kind of got his comeuppance with Lady from Shanghai because that was like his Marion Davies situation. He was trying so hard to turn Rita Hayworth into this uh, art house actor, which was not really something she was interested in. Well, I, I'm not sure I agree with you there, Henry, because I think her performance was great because it was really an image of a person who had no inner landscape, and that was her. But she could have played the same role, and if she had had her long red hair, that mm. film, I'm I swear to you, would have been an enormous success. It's just that all the Rita Hayworth fans just were bewildered, not not by her performance, but by the way she looked. Did he really have to? I mean, what what was the? You know, he was a dynamiter. He was a destroyer. You know, and in the end, of course, he destroyed himself. He would have, look if if Citizen Kane had been a success. Don't think that would have been helpful to Hollywood. That would have destroyed Hollywood because everyone would have wanted to do another Citizen Kane. And you oh, yeah. You can't. You can't do another Citizen Kane. Even he could. Yeah. I uh, re Recently, this is a lot of recent discoveries uh, that Mr. Ar Arcaden is like a Citizen Kane. Would you agree with that? It's a bad Citizen Kane. <laughs> You know, it's a stinky citizen thing, you know, because of Cardin, because of what that phony nose is. I mean, look at the performance, the, compare the performance of a Cardin and, 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 and Kane. I mean, uh, he's wonderful. I mean, one thing we forget is that one reason why it's such a great film is that his performance is overwhelming in Citizen Kane. It's terrible in Mr. Cardin. It's just phony. And the film is phony. So the thing is that um, one can say if he didn't have a Greg Tolan, he could, you know, you can make all sorts of excuses. It doesn't matter. He did have a Greg Tolan. He did have a great cinematographer. And he used that cinematographer in a way that imposed his own interior landscape on cinema so that Citizen Kane is about Orson Welles. It's not about William Randolph Hearst. It's about the interior of Orson Welles. And if you look at it that way, you understand the greatness of the film. It has nothing to do with Hearst. Well, I, I, for some reason, I feel compelled to, to say if any young viewers that are completely or Orson Welles and Citizens Kane are not on the radar. It really should be. And the first time you see it, I don't know if a young person will be blown away or bewildered. I think they would they would get it, but it's you have to be willing to 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 give to to receive too. You have yeah, to Yeah, but the willing. thing is you have Henry, it's really strange. What lasts? You know, very little lasts and yet even if young people don't see Citizen Kane in the same way, they still, Wells is still remembered. I mean, there have been biographies after biographies. He's, he's appeared in film. He's appeared in novels, as you can see. I mean, he's not forgotten, you know. Um, you know, as we move from, you know, there are very few advantages to being old, but one advantage is you pass from generation to generation to see what is adored and what is not adored. And what is adored is often forgotten five minutes later, you know. Mm -hmm. So the idea of anything, everything is ephemeral. It's really, really strange. And now we have this new biography of, of uh, Balanchine. And uh, 
I was a great admirer of Balanchine, so it's fascinating to just go through his life, and I'm going to be writing about him. Um, but I don't think young people would remember, you know, Balanchine and his ballets. I mean, they were some of the greatest works of art of all time, you know. But you have to have seen them. And you have to have seen them when they were directed by, by, uh, by Balanchine himself, because the dancers were dancing for him. So if you are in the audience and you're seeing those ballets performed when Balanchine isn't alive, it's like ghosts. It's meaningless. They're just going through the steps. No. But if you're there when he was alive and they knew he was watching them, there was an excitement in them that was made, made you almost delirious. So it's strange. Everything is strange. Even what our doing this is strange. Oh, sure. Now this, uh, I it's just a little snippet from Hedda Hopper. And comparing her to Luella Parsons, I mean, I don't really know these people. These are these are definitely ghosts. But uh, from what I read, she seems more sane or more uh, more self aware, even self deprecating. And right here, she, she seems supportive of. Uh, oh, she was until she found out that it was about William Randolph Hearst, who was her boss. So. Oh, no, but, but I'm speaking about Hedda Hopper. Who, who oh, came... Hedda Hopper. Yeah. Um, well, Hedda Hopper was, uh, was you know, she wasn't beholden to Hearst. So she, uh, uh, and remember, um, uh, those two women really controlled Hollywood. You know, it's really, uh, it's really amazing. So. Um, uh, well, he I wanted. I'm kind of leading up to asking you if you well, wanted wanted to chat a little bit about how you take raw, the raw data, the the stuff of of life, and then turn it into fiction. My next example is from uh, Movie Land. Right. And you, you're talking about uh, how Gilda, Gilda. just uh, blew you away. Uh, the, the whole world had awoken, exploded into sex after 1946, and uh, Gilda was leading the way. And she had uh, Glenn Ford as a kind of nebbish little guy, but a perfect foil for her. And then this is just a little snippet. I, I'm not going to put you on the spot and have you read from your book, but unless you wanted to. But I just love the uh, the the Wonder Show, the whole Wonder Show uh, sequence. And right here you got Doctor Wells and Magnif Magnifico right. uh, in the Mercury Wonder Show. Could you talk a little bit about how you take the raw data? Do you, do you diagram things out and then it you work? No, I magic? take notes. I read as much as I can. So I must have read, even though there are other biographies I didn't read, I, I must have read at least 10 biographies of, uh, of Wells and three biographies of Rita. And you're always looking for details. You're not looking for anything except, you know, one detail may be worth the reading of an entire book. So that in order to put the Wonder Show together, I needed to know where it was. I needed to know about the tent. I needed to know, you know, what 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 Rita did, what what Cohn did to prevent her from performing in it. And then you build your, you know, your own whirlwind of, it's only a whirlwind of words, you know, you're just putting together uh, something that the reader can see and hear. So those things are very important. I mean, the, the music of the sentence to me is the most important thing. And from the music, uh, you get the image. You know, it's it's very strange. If the music isn't there, I, I can't read. I mean, very often I'll pick up a novel and if that first sentence doesn't whack me over the head, I, I can't continue, you know. Well, and I love the first sentence of this book. Well, then you also need an uh, amazing hook and, and Rusty Redburn is this amazing yeah. hook because right. I, I want to know everything about 
anything Rusty's doing, I'm interested in. And the first uh, sequence, I was an actress who couldn't act, a dancer right. who couldn't dance, a singer who couldn't sing. So I went straight to Hollywood after my sophomore year at, at Kalamazoo. I just love that so well, much. Well, originally it was so I went straight to Hollywood. I had to add that. You know, that wasn't my, that was the editors, you know. I was, you know, a singer who couldn't sing, a dancer who couldn't dance, so I went straight to Hollywood. That's what. That's the way it was originally. Um, yeah, that so runs remember, smoother. Yeah, so remember there, there's also the, the editing, uh, which, um, and in the original version, which I liked, uh, the first thing that Rita does when, you know, when Rusty comes in is that she invites her into a bathtub. So they're both naked in, in Rita's bathtub, but that was taken out of the book, unfortunately. Oh. Yeah, that would have been very, very symbolic, for, uh, <laughs> to put it mildly. Well, I described the way she sees, you know, Rita's back, and uh, it would have been natural for two, you know, for one woman not to be shy with another. Um, yeah, did, but, I can't. I can't think of this movie. Um, oh, it was a movie in the forties, and the 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 uh, ritzy guy welcomes a reporter, and he, the guy's in his bathtub, and he asks the reporter, "Can you hand me a towel?" Oh yeah, that's Laura. Laura. Hmm. Yeah, and then Hollywood itself is a character in this oh, novel. Yeah. I, I have to say that uh, you know, I, I when I did Movie Land, I went out to Hollywood and I stayed at the Roosevelt Hotel and I walked down Hollywood Boulevard to Hollywood and Vine, and, and I really cried. I mean, it, it was home. You know, I knew those that street better than I, I knew you know my name. So it was, uh, even though it, it's kind of kitsch and it's, um, you know, maybe even foolish and stupid, but for me, that was my, Hollywood was my life, really. I grew up on Hollywood. I have very little else. And like Rusty, I mean, yeah. I learned how to eat. I learned how to make love, you know. Um, and even the first line of, of, of movie land, you know, I don't remember, but something about, I can say that, you know, Hollywood ruined my life. It did ruin my life because it gave you a romantic notion about women that you just couldn't get away from, you know. Yeah. And that is not a formula for, for a lifetime of living with someone, you know. Well, uh, the first time I went to Hollywood, I was a very, I kind of had to pass through it. I, I couldn't stay when I was much younger, but more recently I, I went, it was 2015, 2016, and I, I was down on my luck and I had to stay at a hostel. Uh, and it was a really bare bones hostel where you shared with other, other people. And it, it kind of, looking back on it, it was like a wonderful way to, to see Hollywood because I, I was totally down to my bare essentials and just there. Yeah. And uh, everything, I, I, I kept thinking, this is everything's down a human scale, and it's all so beautiful. It's, it seems so, it's like a small town in a way. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, there, there's no there's no doubt about it. And just going from the Roosevelt Hotel to Hollywood and Vine, and there was a billboard of all the actors at that at that time on, on Vine, but I, I, that's since disappeared. Um and going to Musso's and Frank's, you know, uh, which is still there. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, I loved it. You know, I uh, and, and the thing is that uh, writing, uh, you know, Big Red and Big Red is my own invention. I mean, I, I, I mean, uh, uh, Cone didn't ever call her Big Red. I mean, I, I, I made that up. Um, it just seems to me that, uh, you know, my life stopped at a certain age and maybe I think it really stopped at the end of World War II. And it's like that boy in the tin drum who never grows up after the war, you know, and plays this tin drum. I mean, my tin drum was, was, was language. Um, and, uh, 
No, I love that that novel with Tim Drum. Um, but um, it just seemed to me that I, I was uh, reliving something in in that novel that you know that recapturing something that uh, was in there all my life, you know. And uh, I'm I'm jumping around in my head about things that I could bring up. Uh, one thing that I, I love is the dialogue, the moments of of just fun dialogue between uh, Orson and Rita, and yeah. and uh, she says, "Well, I I hate Cohen at the the janitor," and, and Orson pops in like in a like a 1930s rackety rackety uh, pitter patter. He says, "Well, we can hate hate him together." Something yeah. something along that those lines. But here's Musso, yeah. and oh my God, I've I've been there since that first visit. I've been there many times since, and I, I just love it every time. I I know where a lot of the actors uh, were seated. Uh, right. There's regular tables, like uh, well, uh, you you know it yourself, like Marilyn Monroe's favorite table and Charlie yeah. Chaplin's, and of course Quentin, he had to get in on it. Yeah, and then here's some scenes from Lady from Shanghai, which uh, I, I, I really, I, and you say, don't you don't even have to bring it up, but I, I know from my own anecdotal experience that some friends and some family members, they, they just seem like they're, they don't even, they're not receptive to, uh, to Orson Welles and his world. Not my whole family, but just just anecdotal things. I, so I, I keep trying to stress to people, I, like I want to be an evangelist. Say, you just have to go in there and and give it uh, give it a chance, and then all of a sudden you'll, I swear you'll be hooked with a lot of these things that are uh, might seem too old for some people, but they're not. They're they're, they're timeless. They're the opposite of of old. They're timeless. Well, it, look. In one sense, the film doesn't make any sense. This whole plot, this whole killing a man who's not, you know, um, and also his brogue. I mean, I mean this false brogue that he puts yeah. on. Um, but the mirror scene is is the mo most magnificent image we've ever had in Hollywood. It's 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 Hollywood itself. The splintering of of, of of the screen, you know, uh, no one is, is, you know, except for the shower scene in Psycho, which is of a different kind because it's far more violent. Those are the two most powerful, you know, sequences in all of cinema, I think, in all of cinema that I've seen. I mean, maybe maybe there are, there are other things that I haven't seen, you know, so I don't know, but... Uh, the mirror oh. scene in Psycho. I mean, oh, yeah. The, best, the shower scene in Psycho and but the way it's cut and then the, the, the splintering of, of the screen in the mirror scene in The Lady from Shanghai. I mean, I mean, one of the problems for most people who watch it is that it makes no sense. Oh, yeah, of course. Well, I guess I mean people need to... Uh be willing to cultivate an awareness of, of what to tolerate. You go, okay, I know oh, that's dated. I understand that, but I can still enjoy it on, on a different level. I, I'm not so sure. Well, maybe it's dated. I, I have a, an awful lot of trouble with uh, most of the uh, series or movies, you know, uh, about four, quote, young people comedies they're not funny to me i just don't i don't see anything that interesting on tv or or in movie houses you know so oh, yeah uh, a, lot, a lot of it's just garbage i know but maybe there's something maybe it has meaning for certain people and doesn't have meaning for, but it has no meaning at all for me where are we now well, I was just bringing up a, a little bit of from Man, Manzanar. Oh, that, Manzanar. Okay, right. Was there something you wanted, wanted to say about about that? Since it, well, I, I wrote a novel about about Manzanar, you know, called an American Scrapbook. So, was very very important to me, and also 
it's one of the worst things that this country ever did because there was not a single act of sabotage by, and most of the, the, the men and women and children in these camps were American citizens. I mean, and not only that, is that when they were finally freed, um, the young men had to either join the army or go to jail. So it, it was one of the worst incidents in American history and nobody knows about it. See, there, there's no there's no remembrance of this whatsoever, you know. And it's one, of, I, I would say, you know, there are horrors like the Civil War, et cetera, et cetera, but I, I would say this is one of the worst things the American government ever did. It was done to placate you know, white farmers in California wanted to steal the farms of Japanese and their stores. And there was not a single act of sabotage. It was complete nonsense. You know, Germans and Italians were put away also into the interior of the company, of the, of the country, but not these camps, you know. So it was really, uh, oh, okay, you could say it's war hysteria, but... Um, uh, it's completely forgotten, Henry. Do you know anyone who knows about these camps? I I do, but uh, I, you're right. It, it, it's not widely known. I, I kind of clumsily brought this up because Rusty's friend, Julie, and her right. family are, are put into a camp. So that, yeah. And, and since I knew about it, I was able to to write about it. Yeah. And then winding down to uh, the plot uh, of Rita Hayworth and Orson Welles, that she finally's had enough with Orson and she moves on to Ali Khan, who's not, not the, really the best choice, but it worked for a while. Oh, it di didn't work at all. It was, uh, um, it was the worst thing that she could have ever done is that, you know, she was just a trophy to him. And even while he was uh, married to her, he had other girlfriends. I mean, he, he was, um, in in the novel, it's, it's his father, whom I really uh, write about with compassion. And I, I think that even though he had a very interesting war record in World War II. Uh, he was a kind of playboy who gathered horses and gathered women, you know. And then ah, there I we had, go. To, had to include this uh, to, to round Absolutely. things out. Yeah. So it's Edward Sorrell. He was the illustrator for your first book, Once Upon right. a Drashki. And then he comes back in 2020, 1964 for the first book, 2022, Edward Sorrell. Yeah, that's again. interesting, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's he's just... a wonderful, uh, he was originally going to give a blurb and then liked the book so much that he wanted to do the cover. Yeah. Well, he remains one of my favorite uh, illustrators. Oh, he, he certainly is, you know. He certainly is. Well, Jerome, you've been very generous, and I, unless you, there's something else you wanted to to add, I, I thank you for doing this interview. Oh, it's my pleasure, Henry. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm so glad that you liked the book, and uh, you know, it 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 takes, you know, people just think that you know you write a novel and you go on to another one, but you know, you you. You lose blood with every book that you write because you're in in a kind of landscape and you're living with it, whether it's for a year or two years, and then you're revising it, and uh, uh, you never escape the books that you write. You know they remain as ghosts, you know, forever. And well, forever as long as you're alive, you know. But um, and then you go on. How do you start? How do you do you ever really finish a novel and then you've got to start another one? And that's, you know, you have to find that magical first sentence again and again. And is, the, is the next book of Balanchine? 
No, I, I've done one on Maria Callas, and uh, I fell in love with her, and I wrote a novel. I, I have another novel coming out about the Lower East Side in uh, in August, you know, about the early 1920s, you know, um, and because, I, I, again, the Lower East Side was very important to me as a child because that's where my grandparents lived. And in some sense, that was my cradle. You know, that was where I, I came from. And it, when I grew up, it was, you know, almost 90% Jewish uh, and very, very poor. And uh, the poverty is something that's... Uh, that's very haunting, and and uh, and now it's become so intense. I mean, we're in such a divided world, you know, between the wealthy who have ninety percent of uh, of the wealth, and the other, you know, everyone else who have you know have nothing. So uh, the system is going to break, and sadly, it's going to break very soon. And I think it's going to break in our lifetime. We can't go on this way. At some point, people won't be able to feed themselves. And you know, what are we going to do? And you, know, you must see it yourself. I mean, oh yes. You know, it's very sad because uh, there's no reason why you know just paying a fair share of taxes would would change everything. It's not going to happen. You know, so. Here we are. Here we are. <laughs> On that happy note. <laughs> well, um, I will uh, just say that I, I cherish this interview, and I, I just love, uh, I, I just, I spent so much time just enjoying going over all of these things I could ask right. you. Right. And it came, we, we did it. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome, Henry. You, you stay well. <laughs>